We will start the um, introductions uh, for this webinar. We have a galaxy of talent speaking to you this afternoon from the Landmark Chambers Education Law Team. And as I was um, kind of thinking about today, I was thinking it's almost a year to the day um, since we had the previous seminar. And so there is a feeling of Groundhog Day when it comes to discussing possible legal challenges about the exams, albeit that there's no Andy Murray, no Andy McDowell, not, not Andy Murray, that's the tennis player, no Bill Murray, no Andy McDowell, and no cute little gophery thing. Um, so um, we've gone from the sublime to the ridiculous, as we were identifying from the mutant algorithm to the do whatever you want approach that is, um, emanating from the direction from the Secretary of State this year. So we're going to talk about various aspects of the uh, proposals or the way that the exams are going to be run this year and try and identify potential issues that there might be both for parents, schools um, and other interested parties, shall we say, um, to the particular difficulties that the pandemic is continuing to give to those who work in the education sector. So um, I'm going to pass first to Leon, who is going to talk about um, what the overall decisions are that have been made. So um, we're then going to hear from Yasser, who's going to talk about appeals. We're then going to hear from um, Alex, who's going to talk about Equality Act issues. And then finally from Corrine, who for these purposes is the uh, final act. So she's the Beyonce of today, who's going to talk about vocational and technical exams. As ever, we will, after everybody's given their talks, try and open, um, open the floor, so to speak. Please do ask questions as you go through and we'll try and answer as many of them as possible. If there are a large number of them, we may well send a paper out afterwards, um, but we'd like this session to be as interactive as possible. And we've got no doubt, given um, the list of participants, that um, people will have their own views about what's good or maybe not so good about the proposals for this year's exam series. So I now pass to Leon. Thank you very much, Fiona. So we are uh, first going to talk about how the schools are to assess student grades, which really was the meat of the consultation response, which you may have seen um, that came out last week. Um, and so it came out at a really good time for schools as, as schools were trying to organised testing, getting the children back into, uh, into class. They are also given a monumental task um, to organise assessment of exam grades before the summer. So um, schools are certainly not uh, in a very unenviable position at the moment. So as Fiona sort of indicated, I think it's actually going to be much harder for schools this year because last year, schools were simply asked to give a grade and rank, i.e. sort of inputting data into a system. Um, and the system would then churn out a result. Now, the onus this year is very much on what teachers uh, are or schools are assessing as grades. And that's in most, almost all cases going to be the final grade. So the onus really is on schools. And the do whatever your approach, um, as Fiona's called it, uh, is one that will probably create awkward conversations between staff and pupils and parents um, and will be difficult. There's no doubt about that. So in terms of how I will structure this part of the uh, talk, uh, I've got a list here of um, uh, points that we will cover. So we'll take it bit by bit as to how schools are going to assess and we'll unpack those in turn. So we'll start off with the criteria that schools are being asked to use for assessment. Now, the proposal in the consultation, which was broadly adopted, was that assessment should be based on teachers' assessments of the standard of which their students are performing, and that grade should indicate the students demonstrated knowledge, understanding, and skill, and we are told that that met broadly with support. So in the consultation outcome, it was decided, essentially, it's going to be based on teacher judgment, based on a range of evidence related to the subject content, and further advice and assistance is going to be 
provided by both Ofqual and the exam board. So let's unpack that a bit. Let's unpack that very woolly uh, phraseology. So um, the assessment is only going to be on content which has already been delivered to students. There was a debate within the consultation whether there should be a minimum standard or minimum uh, amount of work that should have uh, been done in order to be assessed, but it was said, and I think fairly, I mean, it, it was said that that might cause more problems because it's very difficult to measure what the minimum should be. Different students have had different parts of the course taught at different schools around the country. And some, if you set the minimum, it leads to some students not having achieved that minimum and not getting a grade, and that wouldn't necessarily be their fault. So it's going to be based on um, whatever content has been delivered with no minimum standard. However, the head of centre will still have to sign off that their sufficient content has been delivered so that students can progress to the next stage of education. But again, there's no criteria set on that. It's a declaration. Exam boards are going to help by providing a package of materials, including questions and mark schemes to assist teachers, although it's not compulsory. So the idea being exam boards will give essentially past papers or part papers, I think sometimes that haven't actually been used, they're not in the public domain to teachers and they can be set um, as exercises. Again, it was discussed whether those should be mandatory and the view was taken that it should be optional simply because, again, different students would have covered different parts of the course. So setting a paper on specific content would have been um, difficult. Lastly, it was said that it shouldn't be easier or harder for a student to achieve a particular grade compared to previous years. So that's sort of the theme um, that's been adopted and we'll see that play out in a few moments more. Now, so very much schools have to assess the standard at which students are performing. And I was talking to a head teacher about this and there, the difficulty he said, which has some, I think some real merit, and this is the real difficulty from schools, which is what is a fair grade? And you've got three perspectives on fairness. The first is that of the student. A student will often be aiming for a grade and with a bit of a tailwind and on a good day, they will get that grade. They might be aiming for an A grade. And to them, getting an A grade is fair, and that would be the fair outcome. Then you've got the school's perception of fairness. The school will have data over a number of years as to what the cohorts are generally achieving. And so the school's idea of fairness will be based on broadly what that cohort has achieved in the past. So that's the school's concept of fair, which I think is broadly where the exam boards are heading, but we'll come on to that in a moment. And then there's the national level. There can't be grade inflation throughout the whole country to an undue extent. So that's the national level of fairness. And the difficulty is of piecing together who, whose concept of fairness we're adopting. The guidance is an overly clear on that, is not overly clear on that, but the indication is set out in that quote there is that we're looking at the schools. The school will have to look at previous um, cohorts and see what grades they've got. So they'll be encouraged as part of the overall quality assurance to consider the grades for this year's cohort compared to the cohorts from previous years when exams have taken place to try and make sure um, they aren't too lenient or harsh. What does this do? Well, it provides a huge amount of discretion from schools. There is bound to be huge variations in how schools approach the um, approach the exercise. Um, it doesn't, I mean, this gives a flavor, Alex will be expanding on this, but there is obviously disparities in how students have been taught during the pandemic. Now setting the criteria as the standard at which the student is currently performing will not necessarily or doesn't take into account the particular difficulties of certain groups, et cetera. Um, of learning in the pandemic and, and Alex will come on to that more in the equality um, uh, analysis. So that's the criteria, that's heading one. So what evidence should the school be using? Well, very helpfully, um, well, they've been told uh, you can use a broad range of evidence. Um, so again, lots of discretion for the school, but it is clear that you can use or schools can use evidence throughout the whole course. It's not restricted for a certain time period. And of course, the teachers have the option 
of using the materials provided from the exam board, but pretty much discretion for the school as to what evidence they can use. Timing, so when should it all happen? Well, it should happen as late as possible in the academic year to ensure learning continues or teaching continues for as long as possible. There was a discussion in the consultation about setting a window for assessment when uh, that has to take place, but that wasn't adopted. Um, so there is no, there's no set time, there's a deadline, but um, there's no set time when assessment needs to take place. How do we mark non-exam assessment for the layperson coursework, or as many as I would have called it? So how do we mark that? Um, well, it's going to be marked by teachers and will contribute. And one thing that was up for debate in the consultation was whether partially completed coursework can be taken into account. The view was taken that it can be taken into account as it would be unfair not to because some students will have had better access to complete coursework than others um, and so the uh, whatever coursework has been completed will be taken into account although it does appear to be there's a minimum threshold which Ofqual will um, provide in due course and interestingly there will be no moderation of the, the marking where there's non-exam assessment so teachers grades will be um, well, subject to the quality assurance will be final and the reason for that um, was that not all students have been able to complete the coursework and therefore moderate and moderation will be quite difficult and also the extra burden on schools if they had to send off all the coursework to um, someone else. So no moderation of coursework. Private candidates, so how will they have their grades assessed? You may recall last year there was quite a there's, a, there's a substantial minority of private candidates around the country and they had real difficulty last year in getting grades, as you may recall. So what happens this time? Well, various options were thrown out in the consultation, including so an exam, exams for private candidates, creating two uh, sort of a two tier system. But because it was a two tier system, that wasn't really uh, didn't really have much support. Um, in the consultation that's not been adopted. So the idea is students will work with a centre to produce uh, a grade and they can, so the students will be able to provide the evidence the centre needs. The centre will be able to consider the individual circumstances of what's been taught and then be able to provide a grade. So that's the idea. I think that has more chance of working given the notice now. So private candidates were sort of just thrown in it last time round, but I think this time with the system, this seems to be a viable way of this working. Quality assurance. So what when the school has marked and provided all the grades, what when teachers have provided the grade, should I say, what then happens about moderation and consistency? Well, there will be internal moderation. Um, so internal quality assurance, and that will ensure there's a consistent methodology. You'll have the declaration from the head saying that uh, he stands by the grades, essentially he or she stands by the grades. Um, and then that quality assurance process from the school will then be checked externally. So the process that has happened will be checked externally. Externally as well, there will be a sample of centres that will have the evidence reviewed. So we'll go, go into much more depth into, into the process um, and we'll have that looked at, but any changes to grade across the whole thing will only be based on, um, uh, will, will not be based on marginal differences. So it's sort of real issues that have emerged that will um, only, will, will cause any changes. So where does this all leave us? Um, the onus is very much on the schools this year round. There isn't any algorithm to hide behind. And I, as I said at the start, I think there will be difficult conversations between pupils, teachers and parents. And there may well be attempts to lobby. So schools will need to be um, careful about their process. So not that schools don't have enough to do already, given the pandemic, they will need to come up with a process fairly quickly. So they will need to, I, if, if people are advising schools or, or even if you're challenging schools, these are the things perhaps to look out for. 
make sure there is a clear policy and process on how grades are calculated ideally in writing um, or some that the workings out of that process need to be kept account of because it will maybe held up for scrutiny later there needs to be consistency both between classes in subjects which is something that was familiar because it happened last year but also between subjects i think in schools there's been concern that students might have you know, one method applied in German and another method applied in English and another method in math. So making sure that internally within the school there's a consistent approach. In short, in terms of governance, it, it might be an idea for schools to put their policies or their uh, or their marking criteria to governors um, and then get governor approval or even a subcommittee of governors because it just uh, sort of brings about an extra level of governance in terms of that process and, and in terms of accountability so um, that might be an idea and lastly i think this if any schools often work together particularly in local areas or schools with commonalities if there was ever a time that those links and networks should be used i think it's now making sure there are discussions between head teachers as to what's going on or what the approaches are is going to be helpful for everyone i think to learn off each other i know some schools who sort of really nailed down the process I've done some seminars for other schools recently but I think working together to come up with ideas and trying to make sure you're all broadly doing the same thing will be quite important this time round. So on that note I'll hand over then to Yasa to look at what happens next. <laughs> um, thank you Leon that was great. Um, I am going to be speaking about the appeals process today and as you'll see it's actually pretty straightforward this year which means um, that my talk is going to be very short which is fine but just by way of warning go to the bathroom and you might miss it so here we go um, I thought I would try and pad out my talk <laughs> no just talk about what happened last year because it's interesting to try and compare how different the appeal processes are from last year to this year and that was a reflection of how different the systems are this year as well um, and funnily enough I did this same talk last year on the appeals process and so last year as you may well know probably know you could appeal on administrative and procedural grounds so far so good but you could also appeal based on wrong data and you may remember that that was a function of the algorithm method that was intended to be deployed not in the end um, but that was a very narrow exception. So, for example, it was all about whether schools were using the data from their previous cohorts. Um, and so if you use the wrong data set, then you could appeal on that basis. But you can see there how exceptional it was going to be. And what you definitely could not do was a appeal based on dissatisfaction with your centre assessment grade, i.e. what the teachers had said you would get, or your rank order, your rank in the year. Nor could you appeal based on dissatisfaction with the operation of the algorithm. Um, and so that left a student who had been unduly marked down due to poor results the centre had had in previous years, possibly, with virtually no meaningful ability to appeal. You can see how unfair that was. And in fact, three of us in this talk were involved in one of the two main judicial reviews against the results system last year. RJR focusing on the weak appeals process. So, well, and, and what happened last year, the rest is history. And I don't think I need to go into that. So that's what happened last year. And so this year, how have things changed? Well, you'll see, um, maybe you've read the consultation, Leon referred to it. Interestingly, what was initially, what the initial proposed, or uh, well, the initial proposal was in the consultation. And actually it's one of those rare moments when a consultation process actually results in a change to the, initial proposal because the consultation proposal proposed that there would be an initial appeal to the school an appeal to the school or sorry the center uh, a teacher would then review the pieces of work that had been marked and would decide whether the outcome could not have been arrived at by a person who was reasonably exercising their academic um, academic judgment which would have made for some interesting um chats in the staff room and then there would have been a further appeal to the exam board, but this would be confined to whether the centre had acted in line with procedural requirements. But 100,000 consultation responses later, um, including, it turns out, by some pretty forceful unions, and it was decided that this is going to be too much work for teachers. 
And so what we have instead is what I've referred to, although this is how it's pitched in necessarily in the documents so far, but what we have is essentially a three-step system. This is the compromise. Um, step one, you have mixed student A who thinks she deserves better than what they were, they were given. They ask the center to check whether there's been an admin or procedural error. So to take an example, I use in last year's webinar, you gave me Leon Glenister's grade by mistake, but I'm Glenn Leonster. Um, so the center checks whether there's been that error, and if so, it submits a revised grade to the exam board with the explanation that got mixed up between Leon Glenister and Glenn Leonster. And if the exam board is satisfied with that, doesn't think the center is cooking the books, then it accepts it. So that's step one. Step two, missed student A is told by the center that nope, there's been no admin or procedural error. What does the student do then? They then ask the center to submit an appeal on the student's behalf, saying that he or she deserved a better grade. And the center then submits that appeal, providing the evidence used to form its assessment, the justification for the grade, the student's concerns, and the details of the process to determine the grade. So this is a, a substantive appeal on, on the substance. And then what is the test to be applied by the exam board? Well, the issue will be whether there's been an appropriate or reasonable exercise of academic judgment by the school. And I use both of those terms there because the, because the consultation response uses them both for different parts. But the, the point is that what is not envisaged is a remarking they will not be interested in marginal differences of opinion. The question is whether there was a reasonable exercise of judgment. And the devil will obviously be in how liberally that term reasonable is interpreted this year. And the exam board will also consider at the same time whether the centre has followed the correct process in awarding the grades. And then moving on to step three, what if the exam board decides that the grade awarded was a reasonable exercise of academic judgment? Well, then that's the last step for the student. They can apply to off-calls exams procedures review service. But again, that will be limited to reviewing the process used by the exam board and it won't provide for review of the merits of the decision itself. And so just a point on timing, when, when is all of this going to happen? Well, the direction, the Secretary of State's direction talks about the appeal process concluding in early September for those whose place at higher education depends on the result of the appeal. But then for everyone else, there's no word on timing. Wait to see more information on that. And then finally, some problems. I mean, not, not problems as such, the first one anyway, just for students need to be aware that their grade can go up or down as per normal. Um, but also the volume of appeals obviously going to be an issue, but it's an issue which Ofqual has sought to combat, and it's actually if they have sought to combat. So it's come up with the following solution, which is that centres will tell students the evidence on which the grade is based before submission of the grade to exam boards. So think about how that's going to work practically. Then to think it's come up with a good um, portfolio of evidence to use, it will then provide this to the students, and students will then have the opportunity essentially to make representations still if they think that that evidence is not sufficient. And I'm heartened by the optimism, but I don't think we should kill ourselves that there are not going to be lots and lots of appeals this year. Um, but I can just see that allowing students to make representations in the way state is going to cause at best real headaches for teachers and centres and at worst unfairness. Um, and that is the end of my talk, but ominously I see Fiona lurking at the top of my screen, so she might correct something wrong I've said. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to correct anything. The only point I was going to make before we moved on to Alex is this point about the fact that the centres are going to have to tell everyone, which I think causes firstly a practical issue, which means that the submission of all grades is meant to happen by the 18th of June, but any process a school needs to build in needs to build in an adequate time for you to show the students the material. Um, well, maybe not the actual material, but say we have based your grade on X and Y and Z and allow them to make representations. 
Um, yeah. And, you know, so that's a sort of practical issue. And as well, just to sort of say, the consultation responses I read it said, there will be a right of appeal. So it, centres aren't going to be able to say, no, we're not going to submit that appeal on yeah. behalf of the student. Basically, so as a centre, you're also going to need to, if you're acting for schools, you're also going to need to get together a kind of a standardised appeal pack, really, so that all your students who are unhappy with their grades can then appeal onwards. And I would suggest that that happens now rather than in August. So it was just a kind of couple of practical. No, that's things. great. Yeah, I agree with all of that. OK, so sorry for my interference. No, no, very valuable. If, Thank if, you. If, if we move on to Alex now, apologies. I'm going to shut up. Hello, everybody. Um, I am, in fact, the person in that photo. Um, I'll be talking about um, equality issues arising from the 2021 exams. Um, now, I'm not a betting man, but I suspect there may be at least one or two equality challenges coming out of the exams this year. So it's probably a good idea um, to brush up just in case. But before we get there, There we go. Um, I just invite you to take a look at this beautiful flow chart. Um, I take credit for it, but you'll see from the bottom right hand corner, it's nothing to do with me. I've just stolen this from um, OCR. Um, and you'll see that we are expecting um, exam board guidance um, this month um, on how to how uh, centres are going to be running this process fairly. Um, and then we have the parallel processes for teachers um, determining student grades um, with quality um, assurance um, from the exam boards. Um, and you'll see that the results are, are due on the 10th um, and the 12th of August, um, respectively. Okay, so what's the legal framework that we're talking about here in terms of equality issues? Um, firstly, the Human Rights Act, um, which we still have, um, which you'll hopefully be familiar with. Um, then we've got Article 14, Protection from Discrimination, um, Article 2, Protocol 1, Right to Education. Um, but then probably more pertinent is the Equality Act. Um, and I just emphasise in particular um, the duty to make reasonable adjustments under Section 20, which is likely to uh, be an issue with these exams this year. So there was an equality impact assessment um, attached to the recent consultation, um, which went out. Um, and then there was an amended um, equality impact um, assessment um, that came out with the final decision um, as well, which is um, quite a clever way of proofing um, quality impact assessments against a PSED challenge. And I think in general, we can probably expect more of this kind of approach because it just means that you capture all of the uh, the obvious um, problems um, in your uh, as as a decision maker um, in in your assessment before you uh, actually go forward with the decision. Um, and what does the first equality impact assessment say? Uh, well, it says there's likely to be relative advantages and disadvantages for different groups um, for those who share protected characteristics. Um, and it goes on to say that we don't consider. Um, that there are likely to be many problems with um, disabled students, um, at least not if the assessments were undertaken within the school um, or college. Now, the, uh, there was some response from that, not least from um, the RNIB, um, and I think it was the uh, National Deaf um, Children's Society as well. So that's revised slightly um, in the new EIA that came out because actually there are quite a few issues. Um, and unfortunately, those um, still remain, which we'll go on to speak about. Um, what else does the first equality impact assessment say um, about disabled students? Well, just in terms of reasonable um, adjustments, it, it makes the point that given the pandemic, um, it's likely to be difficult for some adjustments, um, for example, coloured um, paper um, to be used um, in a home setting um, compared to a school setting. Um, and that might be uh, difficult when you have um, work that's being assessed by teachers, but it hasn't been produced um, in a way uh, that has a reasonable adjustment. Uh, 
just in terms of other issues raised um, in version one of the equality impact assessment. Firstly, the issue of um, private candidates, a lot of private candidates are actually taken out or have been taken out um, of the state system due to um, due to send um, or, or illness. Um, and so I think mean, there's a, a those sort of students are disproportionately represented among private candidates. Um, and then you have um, the additional issue, um, which I encountered um, in one case last year, which is where if teachers are assessing um, a student, it's quite difficult for them to do so if the student um, has poor attendance um, due to, um, for example, illness um, or SEND. So having taken in um, a lot of these comments about some of the problems. What does the um, revised quality impact assessment um, say? Well, the, the main point that they make um, is that SENCOs um, should be involved um, in the process um, of assessing um, students um, with SEN, um, which is helpful. Um, but in general, the, there hasn't been too much um, of a change um, in terms of the approach. The centres have a responsibility to put in place reasonable adjustments for disabled students. We expect that they're going to be made. Um, if they're not going to be made, centres will be asked to take in, that into account in their judgment. So not really much in the way of guidance as to how they do that and what weight should be given to a failure um, to have reasonable adjustments, and which as we'll see, um, is, is something of an issue. So, what are the likely problems? And I've already um, highlighted the reasonable adjustments one, which I'm going to be starting with. Um, there's also a potential risk of bias and unfair treatment, basically because we're saying to schools, well, you, you, you do this, you, you work this out, it'll be fine. So how do we ensure consistency um, across different centres? That's a key issue. And then there's socioeconomic disadvantage as well, which Leon's already um, touched on, um, which is a big problem. So just going back to reasonable um, adjustments then, you have this really um, broad discretion given to centres as to how they assess students. Um, and some of the decision um, states they can take into account a number of things, including student work, coursework, um, internal tests, um, sort of example tests from past years, that sort of thing. So th the difficulty there is, um, if there wasn't a reasonable adjustment, um, as we said, um, when they undertook that uh, exercise, how is a centre able to, you know, reach a, uh, a rounded view of what the, that student would have been able to achieve, um, perhaps if the reasonable adjustment had been made? And we saw in the 2020 guide to appeals malpractice maladministration um, is that the um, centres have got to basically imagine what the student would have got if the adjustment um, had, been, had been made um, and that should form the basis of the assessment. Slightly different now, um, arguably a, a broader discretion, just saying you have to take it into account. So you don't necessarily have to sort of top up as it were, every piece of coursework that wasn't done with appropriate reasonable adjustments. You just have to take a more a sort of broader, more rounded view, um, which as you can imagine, um, op opens the, uh, the door to um, some, some schools or centres doing things slightly differently or approaching or applying slightly different standards. So yeah, we've covered that. Yeah, and there's a question as to how the appeals are going to run this time if there has been an alleged um, accessibility failure. Um, there's a couple of ways you could have done it last year. Um, you could have tried to persuade the centre that actually they'd made an administrative error in submitting uh, the CAG uh, because they hadn't taken into account, um, for example, the fact that reasonable adjustments weren't, weren't made um, in the um, you know in certain work that was um, submitted. Um, po possibly quite difficult to persuade a school to um, to do that. So what you could also do alternatively is complain directly to the exam board for um, maladministration or bias, basically saying that they didn't take into account these reasonable adjustments, that was wrong. Um, can, can you sort this out? Um, what version two of the EIA says, which is um, appended to the decision, um, is that basically you can appeal um, di directly um, where 
there's been a suggestion that there's been a bias or, or discrimination, which would include a failure um, to make reasonable adjustments to have that grade reviewed. So you'll see how this wider appeal process um, is likely to have a lot um, of equality and discrimination um, challenges um, in uh, following the uh, the release of the grades um, in the summer. It's not clear whether you're still able to do the sort of um, what I'd say is the, the standard complaint to the exam board saying, look, this whole process is, you know, is, that the centre has run is it's completely wrong. Um, you probably could because you can complain about um, centres for you know bad things such as discrimination in, in, in general. Um, so there might be a possibility of parallel processes there, but I think the first, first thing to do is to go through the standard appeal, appeals process. So just in terms of the risk of bias um, and un unfair treatment, we've already touched on the fact that different centres can um, uh, assess things differently. And so there's clear issues of um, inconsistency, which I'll come to slightly later in the, in the sort of private state school um, divide. Um, we are expecting this month the uh, guidance from the exam boards as to how this is going to um, or work. Um, and I, I suspect even after that, that guidance has, has come out, um, there's going to be some lingering um, ambiguities um, and uncertainties. Um, and yeah, I've already touched on the point that um, it's going to be difficult where you have students who um, you know, basically haven't been seen much um, by their teachers and so their teachers aren't able to reach a confident view of what that student's grades are and it might maybe for no fault of the student's own. Finally I'll just come to socio-economic um, disadvantage. Um, obviously socio-economic um, disadvantage um, isn't a protected characteristic um, under the Equality Act although we hope that that oversight will be um, corrected at some point in the future um, but nevertheless people with protected characteristics um, are often um, economically disadvantaged, um, more likely to be in state schools and in schools with, with fewer resources. Um, and so we do see um, a disproportionate loss um, in terms of learning um, over the course of the pandemic and by people, um, by, by students um, with um, protected um, characteristics, disrupted education. So, for example, if you're in a private school, you're far more likely to, at the start of the pandemic, to have already had uh, a pretty uh, nifty online learning platform that could be utilised straight away, whereas a lot of state schools had to scramble to, to come up with something. Um, and that represented a significant loss of learning um, for those students. Um, we obviously, we know the difficulties of remote learning. If there's only one laptop um, in the house, uh, then that might have to be shared between um, mom and dad and, and the students or multiple um, students. Um, so remote learning, not great for people who are socio socially disadvantaged. Wi-Fi connection, also a big problem too. Um, not quite clear how these gaps in knowledge um, are going to be addressed um, under this um, current system. Um, and we'll come to in a second um, what the uh, revised equality impact assessment says. Um, we all know what happened last year with the um, the algorithm, uh, the fact that many, um, because private schools have historically better performance, um, you had issues where the algorithm basically gave a boost to them. And, and if you're from a, a, a school which didn't have a very good performance, then you're sort of marked down based on um, the school's past performance, even if you personally um, were brilliant. So that wasn't good. Um, and then finally, just to just to add to the um, the woes a bit, we. A, it's very well reported that um, teachers from private schools are, are more likely to take a, an optimistic view, shall we say, um, of students' likely performance. Um, and you get the opposite effect in many state schools um, where you might have brilliant students who aren't given good predicted grades, um, which in and of itself is, is, is problematic when you're applying for universities. But if that's going to be your final grade, then we can expect a uh, much greater um, disparity between um, private and public schools, I'm uh, sorry, public sector schools. Fiona, yes. No, all I was going to say is my um, reading of the consultation response is that you are going to have to um, take into account reasonable, what grade somebody would have got had the reasonable adjustment been made, um, because it would seem to me that otherwise you would open yourself up to an almost automatic challenge because you failed to make the reasonable adjustment in the first place, which you should have made. I mean, there might be some circumstances, I'm particularly thinking about children who only receive diagnoses 
last year or this year. <laughs> so you've got somebody, so leaving aside that position where there would be an argument as to whether or not you would have to make a reasonable, um, a, a reasonable adjustment, you're in a situation whereby if you haven't made the reasonable adjustment and arguably that's discriminatory, it's definitely discriminatory if it's caused a substantial disadvantage. So it seems to me practically, you would have to judge the work as if the reasonable adjustment had been made. And as you say, Alex, in some areas, reasonable adjustments can easily be made for remote learning. And for some learners, in fact, remote learning has been very good. You, you know, I mean, I can think of some people with social interaction difficulties who might have sensory overload, who they're at home, they've got a laptop, you know, they're able just to carry off. But certainly for people who, um, who haven't got access to IT um, or who have got a sort of a blind or deaf or have all those kinds of sensory impairments, um, I think it's going to be very difficult for the school to have realistically replicated those within a home learning setting. I mean, don't forget that certainly throughout children with EHC plans and other vulnerable children um, can have taken advantage of being in school. But obviously there was there's a wide variety of what's then taught in school um, for those children who go in. So you wouldn't necessarily have that. So I think the, the issues for children with disabilities are really possibly quite acute. And the thing that I was gonna ask you is, as under the, as the current position is that everybody's gonna to be told their grades, should parents seek to make representations about reasonable adjustments at that stage and or seek to kind of cut the school off at the pass uh, I mean, that's what's suggested in the consultation, but I'm just thinking about sort of bringing claims or running some sort yeah. of emergency injunctions if it looks like um, there's a real problem with what the school has done. Um, Alex, have you got any views about that? Yeah, yeah potentially. And, and certainly if, if you think as a parent or someone advising parents, if you think that there are going to be likely to be issues, then I think it's important to gather as much um, evidence as you, as you can as to what the reasonable adjustments need to be and, and should be um, at, at this stage as well. Now, as with some students, it might be very obvious what that is, but if, say, you've got a child who's got, say, an anxiety disorder, um, for example, it'd be really important to get that GP's note now and you can present it to the school now and say, look, this the child needs extra time. Um, and if the child doesn't have extra time, for example, then there are clearly going to be issues later down the line in terms of re reasonable adjustments. Um, yeah. So, yes, and but certainly... I mean, oh, yeah. go on. I mean, arguably, you've got an entire generation of children who've got anxiety disorders as a result of being stuck at home for the past year. Yeah. So you've possibly got significantly more students who may well, during the course of the pandemic, had de undeveloped mental health problems, which would count as disabilities, which schools are also going to have to take into account when they're thinking about assessing the work that's already been done and the work that they might want to have them to do to try and check the assessments. Yes, definitely. And I think a number of consultees made that um, point to, to the government initially. And I, I think the, the Equality Impact Assessment version two does note the problem of sort of general sort of COVID um, related anxiety and mental illness, but slightly avoids the question as to how um, centres sort of deal with this when, it, when it, as, as you say, very many students um, are suffering compared to other generations and other year groups as, as a result of the pandemic. Um, but yes, that's that's definitely something um, that they should be considering. I see there being sort of issues around that. Mm, definitely. Um, okay, you haven't finished your slides, so I will let you carry on. I do apologise, Alex. Oh, no, no worries. Um, I ju just wrapping up on socioeconomic um, disadvantage then. So what does the, the IA say? It says, well, we won't know until results are issued the extent uh, of the impact of the pandemic on students' education. But um, as I say in the slides, we can probably hazard a guess. It's probably not going to be great overall. But then as, as Fiona um, said, in some, in some cases, it might well be better um, if a student um, it, it does better um, it, with digital learning, that's fine. Um, and then what, what, what does it say? Oh, so this second one is about gaps um, in knowledge. Um, so some students will have a poor knowledge and understanding of the topics they've been taught because of the impact of them of the of disruption on their education. However, they say if qualifications are to continue to link higher grades with higher standards of performance, none of the options available can fully remove um, the way that the disruption to students' education might have an impact on them. 
so that's I think that they're trying to cut off exactly that kind of general um, challenge there, um, saying that well we've got to have some kind of um, assessment, um, but it does raise quite difficult issues um, where you have some students who have um, had massive chunks of the curriculum just just not taught to them um, compared to others. Um, whether it's really fair to be um, assessing them in the same kind of way, I, I don't think so. So ju just to wrap wrap things up, then um, I think it's fair to say the government has made a you know, meaningful attempt to grapple with some of these equality issues or at least acknowledge them. Um, but uh, the, there's no easy solutions and certainly all of the solutions haven't been provided um, by the government who have basically said that, um, that schools and exam boards um, should work these issues out. So we can expect, um, I think, quite a few equality challenges um, coming um, over the next 12 months or so. Thank you, Alex. We're now passing on to Kareem, telling us all about vocational and technical exams. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, yes, well, I'm still basking in the glow of being described as the Beyonce of this lineup, uh, the headline act at the end of a, a long evening. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you today about vocational and technical exams or VTQs, as they're known in the consultation document and the final decision document. So um, the consultation um, which took place alongside the consultation on A-levels and GCSEs and other, other qualifications um, set out that the impact of the pandemic meant that in line with the approach um, set out for GCSEs and so on, the department's policy position would be that external exams for many, but not all, vocational, technical and other general qualifications should not take place as planned but not all, and you'll see, and I hopefully I will explain the difference to you. So the joint consultation in January covered um, A-levels and GCSEs, but also VTQs. And the consultation recognised expressly that VTQs are rather different to A-levels and GCSEs. They're a really diverse landscape. Qualifications differ in their purpose, uh, the extent to which they are um, knowledge-based or they're designed to assess competency, the, the settings in which they're taken, the age, stage and circumstances of learners and um, the assessment structures and methods. And also it, it's just sometimes a question of the size of the qualification and the length of the course. So they were diff really dealing with a very different um, set of qualifications to just your standard A-levels and, and GCSEs and so on. Um, so what was decided, um, having um, undertaken that comprehensive consultation? Well, you need to look, at, if you're interested in VTQs, you look at one document and there it is. I've put it in the slide. Um, it's one document called Alternative Arrangements for the Award of VTQs and Other Qualifications in 2021. It's a joint department for education off call um, document. And the broad outline is that because of that diverse range, which I've just identified, VTQs have been separated into three separate groups and different approaches are outlined for each. Now it's an 88 page um, document which sets out all the final, final detail. Now, I'm only going to give you a broad analysis here today of, of what has been decided in respect of the three um, different categories. It's important to understand that there is also, at the end of that document, there's a separate equality impact assessment and a regulatory impact assessment. So if you're interested in equality issues relating to these categories of qualifications, then have a look at that document um, to see what the government um, said. It's really important to understand, of course, that VTQs tend to have groups, well, their learners tend to be groups which are already underperforming um, compared to their peers uh, in many cases. So um, equality issues are particularly important, but Alex has already really helpfully covered that. So your first category of the three is where a particular qualification is used for progression, i.e. They need uh, the grades in order to access further or higher education. So, um, as I've said in my first bullet point, the, the first group includes VTQs, which are basically the most similar to GCSEs and AS levels and AL, A levels um, because they're used uh, for progression purposes. And that includes lots of VTQs, including BTECs, 
Cambridge Nationals Technicals, uh, many different technical awards, as well as other general qualifications that aren't GCSEs, such as the International Baccalaureate, PreU, um, I won't read them all out, but um, there are a number of other um, qualifications which are similar to GCSEs and A-levels in that. Now, the position in relation to them is exams for these VTQs should not go ahead. Instead, results have to be awarded using similar arrangements to GCSEs and AS or A-levels, um, which have been covered, obviously, by the other talks today. But um, everything is not identical. Now, it's beyond the scope of a short talk to tell you uh, all the ins and outs of that, but you will find all the detail in, in the document I have outlined. Um, category one, um, awarding bodies will issue guidance, um, and this is the guidance we're waiting for to providers and colleges about what evidence is needed for a teacher assess grades and timelines for information to be submitted. So that's still all to come. The consultation doc, well, the decisions document doesn't, doesn't give any further guidance than that. So um, if you're um, going to be assessing BTECs or you're in that category, uh, look out for that, that um, guidance, which will come, come soon. You then have a second category. They are VTQs, which are used directly for employment. So instead of being a grade which is required in order to um, move on to higher or further education, there, um, you, your grades and your qualifications are used to enter directly into employment. So for the examples I've given are, for example, construction qualifications, accountancy, plumbing. Um, in those cases, the situation is different. Exams or assessments should continue where they are critical to demonstrate occupational or professional competence and can be delivered in, in line with Public Health England measures. So pausing there, um, there's obviously a, a discretion to be had, but you can see easily why, for example, if you're doing a plumbing course, that you're going to have to demonstrate at some point that you can actually do your plumbing. Um, and, and you can see why in some situations it would be critical to be able to demonstrate a particular competence in a particular area um, at the end of a course. So they can't just say, well, six months ago you were good at this. You have to show that you're now good enough at a particular um, in a, or have a particular competence. Where the assessment cannot take place safely, so that means it cannot be delivered in line with PHE measures, it will need to be delayed and these may be written or practical exams and assessments. Um, but the general principle is they should continue if, if they are needed. Now category three is um, mixed purposes. So the third group includes um, smaller, smaller qualifications um, taken for mixed purposes that are unlike GCSEs and A-levels in their qualification and assessment structure. Now that's things like functional skills qualifications which are hugely important to lots of people who cannot access uh, GCSEs or A-levels. Those that tend to be qualifications which are where you sit the assessment on demand when the learner is ready. And it also includes, for example, English for speakers of other languages. Now, the guidance here or the decision that's been made here is that exams and assessments for these should continue where they can be delivered in line with PHE measures or remotely, but with alternative arrangements available for those who cannot access the, uh, the assessments. Now, this was a bit controversial. Lots of people said, well, wait a minute, you can't, can't require this. Um, why should they continue to have exams and assessments? But the decision taken, I mean, the, you'll see the consultation responses, which are recorded in the, the document, which I've drawn your attention to, uh, really do demonstrate that there was real controversy over this issue. But the decision means that basically the, the reason why the government went for it is because wherever possible, um, learners um, should be supported to progress to the next stage of their studies. So if you're holding back learners, um, so someone is sitting a functional skills level one, um, they, they just can't move on to level two and they should be allowed to move on when they are ready rather than having to wait. So um, the decision taken was that they should take an assessment um, and alternative arrangements should only be considered for those who can't access one. And that, as I see at the end of this slide, is that to ensure that learners can be supported to progress. And the thing about functional skills qualifications, of course, is that as, as they're on demand, they take place throughout the year. So if um, someone isn't ready for pandemic related reasons, they can continue to 
to work and then sit the assessment at a later stage in any event. So dates and timing. Well, I've realized I've spelled Ofqual wrong. That's terrible, isn't it? Um, DfE and Ofqual have said it is essential um, that students taking VTQs and other general qualifications that are not GCSEs or A-levels, but are used to progress to HE and FE, so you'll remember that was category one, should receive their results no later than their GCSE or A-level peers. So it's therefore expected that the relevant VTQ results are issued to students on or before um, 10th of August for level three and 12th of August for level two. So that accords with the timeline that you saw in, in Alex's slides. But results for other VTQs, such as teacher assessed grades for functional skills learners, will continue to be issued throughout the year like usual, but only from April is what we're told about that. And then any problems, I couldn't really see any problem. I mean, you'll recall that last year there was an absolute car crash when it came to BTEX and, and other VTQs because of the last minute U-turn and what was going on. So you'll recall maybe that Pearson, at the, for example, as one of the one of the bodies involved uh, decided in August, I think the day before uh, results were meant to be coming out, that um, they were going to withdraw all level one and well, level two results. They just weren't going to, to publish them. And then you had some people, as time went on, some people had them and some people didn't have them. And by the beginning of September, people were still waiting. So this is level you know, sort of category one people. They were still waiting for results, which they needed to be able to progress on to a, another course. Um, so it was an absolute disaster. I can't foresee that happening because it's actually quite well organized this year in terms of timing and the guidance is fairly clear as to, to what should happen. Um, there is a slight issue around January 2021 exams because some people obviously sat exams then. And they're now, they now they said in the consultation responses, well, wait a minute, I sat my VTQ in January 2021. Um, I had had a terrible year because pandemic and we we I feel like I, I didn't, you know, now I'm going to be marked on that exam and it's not fair. Other people didn't sit it. Um, and I'm now going to get end up with a lower grade than someone who didn't sit it and is assessed in a different way. Well, the government actually has has dealt with that already and said that the in relation to the anyone who sat exams in January, so before the, these announcements and before this document was published, that where learners did not feel comfortable sitting assessments, they didn't have to, and some centres decided not to uh, run assessments, um, and many learners didn't. But if you did sit it in January, uh, you will still be able to progress fairly irrespective of whether you sat an exam in, in January. So there will be an assessment um, in the normal way, so following the, the new uh, decision-making uh, guidance, uh, regardless of whether you sat the exam in January or not, and all other evidence will be taken into account in assessing what grade you ultimately get. So hopefully that has already resolved that problem. I agree with Alex that the other problem might, uh, is around um, equality uh, impact issues. Um, that's obviously been very fairly covered by, by Alex already, but I would ask you to look at um, page 63 onwards of the document, which will tell you what the government had to say about that when you're exploring whether you're going to bring your Equality Act claim. Uh, Fiona, you've popped up before I, do you want to say something before I turn to appeals? No, 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 no. no. Sorry, no, no. I'm, I've jumped the gum somewhat in my... No, no, don't worry. I just, I'm only just going to say a, a thing or two about appeals. Statutory guidance uh, will signal for those qualifications most aligned so, to GCSEs. So that's the category one you'll remember on my slide. Um, that will be... Uh, the Students will be given access to a right appeal on the same basis as um, those for GCSE. So everything that's already been said about appeals by Yasser still stands um, for those people. Others depends on the type of qualification. And I haven't set this out here because it's complicated, but um, check the detailed guidance, um, check your 88 pages because there'll be an answer. Schools and colleges will have only to check for errors and whether their processes were followed in the way that Yasser has explained. And then um, if students want to take it further, exam boards will review both the school or college's processes and the exercise used to determine a student's grade. So this, this exactly the same um, applies as with GCSEs, AS and A-levels. And that's the end of my talk. So thank you very much for listening. I'll hand back over to Fiona.
Right, I'm going to ask if everyone, uh, if all the speakers could put their um, cameras and their microphones on. We've got a number of questions that would be, um, so thank you very much for the enthusiasm of the questions. We always like it when there are a lot. Um, I, I won't say who's asked the question just because for sort of data protection reasons, because we put this on YouTube. Uh, it means we don't have to exercise the right to be forgotten if we say your names. So the first question is about art. Now, art is going to be um, examined 100% by the portfolio. Now, what happens in usual years is you actually get told the mark you're going to get for the portfolio before it goes up. And the portfolio in um, art is always, it's at least 50% usually of your GCSE and your A-level grade, if not more than that. So this year, you're not going to get told your mark because it's 100% coursework. You're just going to be given the evidence. So there won't be any opportunity to challenge that mark in advance in a way that you could have done in normal years. Now, there's nothing in the consultation response about this because I've just gone through it and double checked. Um, I mean, it seems to me that, um, it seems to me that I think art students are probably gonna have to be in the same position as everyone else and therefore are gonna be given the evidence but aren't going to be able to be given the grades. But I think it's probably worthwhile raising that with the exam board, just in case it's an oversight on their part. Um, but I think, I mean, my view is, is I think that a decision has been made to say we're not going to tell people their grades for the portfolio, because in a way, everybody else is, is in the same boat this year. It's all gonna be based on coursework or if you've done a little exam or those sorts of things. Does anybody have any different view about that? No, I'm, I agree with that, Fiona. Um, the relevant sections, I'd say section 16, which has about the evidence being given then yeah. uh, to a page and then page 10 is about art and about the portfolio and putting those together. I don't think you will get the grade before. I, mean, I, was, I, would, I, 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 mean, I would imagine if you've had your portfolio marked as you're going along, but what sometimes happens is you get each individual piece marked and then your portfolio is then assessed as a whole, or that's how it used to work. Um, when I did it anyway. Um, so uh, I think you would have a rough idea of, I think like all these things, a lot of this work is already going to have been marked. So I think you're going to have some idea of where you might be heading if you're being given the evidence. And obviously in art, it can only be, this is the stuff, this is the work you've been doing, some of which would already have been assessed and graded. Leon, have you got any views about that? No, uh, no, I agree. I was, I was interested in this bartering system. I didn't know in art, you sort of in New Year's, you have a barter with the teacher about your grade. Well, I'm not sure a barter would be the word that I would describe <laughs> I it know. as, but but you would get us, you would have a dialogue. Well, it's art, yeah. you know, creative expression. Some people would say you shouldn't be able to assess art GCC and A level anyway, because it kind of doesn't work like that. But yeah, okay. We've then got a series of questions about going to the special needs tribunal or reasonable adjustments. So um, let's just sort of clear a few things up. The difficulty that you've got is that there are a number of different prospective respondents to any claim and you bring those cases in different jurisdictions. So if the claim is the um, school hasn't made the correct reasonable adjustment, um, and that therefore has led you to have a substantial disadvantage, i.e. get a worse grade. That's a case against a school which goes to the FTT. That's the first tier tribunal. If, however, it's a case about the exam board saying the exam board have failed to take into account these various reasonable adjustments or the exam the way that the assessment process or the evidence process, I mean, I think this is gonna be quite hard this year, but in usual years, you would say the way that the evidence process has worked has meant that it, you know, reasonable adjustments haven't been made. Then that's a claim that goes to the county court before the exam boards. So you may well have two claims before two different jurisdictions because the first tier tribunal can't make any remedy against the exam board, whereas the county court arguably could. But I think there is a further difficulty, which is any court, whether you're talking about a court or a tribunal, is gonna be very reluctant to give you a different grade. 
I think all it will do will be to ask the organisation to think again, because giving you a different grade is, is an exercise of academic judgment. So query, the most I think practically you're going to get from this situation would be um, a chance of a remark in effect or a, a thinking again. I don't know whether my illustrious gang think any differently. I'll just read out my, my note, Fiona. It might be more likely for an order asking schools to do it again rather than substituting grades. So yes, completely agree. Yeah. So, uh, and, and um, it, obviously you can also judicially review a kind of an overall policy or practice um, if, if it's discrimination in some way or um, under the Equality Act, those are the only bases. Um, so, um, so I think we've answered two of those questions. And then I think we've got another question um, about outside of JR, what role do we see solicitors playing in the appeals process? Do you envisage parents seeking advice for making representations to the centre or the onwards appeal process? They seem to be mostly handled by the centre themselves. Um, I mean, guys, it would seem to me that the most likely engagement is going to be either if the centre is very hostile and says we're not going to bring an appeal, well, or if there are Equality Act issues. It seems to me that in most other cases, most schools will have a pack that parents will be able to fill in. I mean, don't forget the other thing that schools have got to do, as well as work out the evidence, do possibly more assessments, possibly almost inevitably do more assessments, I suspect, for some students, um, work them out, do the internal QA, do the external QA, have the discussion, allow time for the representations, is they've also got to run a support system for students if they want to appeal. I mean, there's going to be a helpline set up for students, but it also says that schools will be expected to support pupils. So I think that means having a pack ready to go that people can then fill in. Um, I know that's what happened last year, was that a lot of schools got kind of packs together for pupils who wanted to do that. Does anybody else have any other views before I bang on unnecessarily again? No? Well, well, one thing, I don't know whether it means lawyers will be involved, but I think the key time to try and make your case is probably to the school when you see the evidence, because after that point, it only gets harder to challenge. So at that point, you, could, you might be able to influence the school. But once they have exercised that academic judgment, it's going to be very hard for the exam board. Yeah. So that's the most important stage. OK. And then you've got, um, do you agree that the reference to reasonable adjustments means reasonable adjustments in the broadest sense under the Equality Act, not just reasonable adjustments that have been formally approved by the exam boards via the JCQ process. Well, my answer is it means reasonable adjustments under the Equality Act, because obviously there are a series of adjustments which are usually made to exams, usually scribes, more time, breaks, those sorts of things. All of those I think will be considered to be reasonable adjustments that a centre might want to make if, for example, you know, I mean, exam one one way to at least provide some of the evidence would be you'd get everyone to sit a past paper or sit a couple of questions of a past paper once they're all back from next week onwards. That would all have to be done in line with whatever the JCQ process is, it would seem to me. Otherwise, you know, you possibly run into difficulties. But no, I think it's reasonable adjustments more generally. Um, I'm seeing lots of nodding heads. Then there's another one, which is, is the answer for teachers to give students one grade up than they would ordinarily fairly assess on the basis that the student parent is likely to be happy about this and the moderator is unlikely to quibble about a slight enhancement? I love that question. That's my favourite. Yeah, we love that question because that's the sort of question I'd be asking myself if I was a teacher. I think the answer to that is... Um, I suppose it depends. I mean, I'm going to give the answer is it depends... I think the formal answer is no, you shouldn't, <laughs> because it's meant to be on the basis of that. Is that what in reality might happen? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> Let's look at the reality. Last year, last year was a system where teachers thought that they were going to be strictly moderated according to an algorithm. Yeah. And there was, what, 15% grade inflation. This yeah. year, teachers, um, even, even acting in good faith, I'm not saying the teachers are going to act in bad faith, acting in good faith, there's going to be much more inflation than that. 
and great inflation. Well, I mean, but bear in mind that Yasser okay. is in fact married to a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so he has some skin in this game, shall we say, and a teacher who is going to be undertaking those internal and external assessments. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of schools last year said that they downgraded their students, which is why they were so upset when the algorithm came out, because they'd said they'd already marked their internal assessments were more severe than they would really have thought. So, but on the other hand, the exam center will call, the exam boards will call in assessments which are significantly outside the norm. But I mean, if everybody does it, what are you gonna do? But also if you're, if you're almost most teachers, most centers are gonna, a professional will act, act appropriately. They're always gonna have their, minds on those few centers or teachers who are going to try and game the system then it become a, a sort of prisoner's dilemma where if you act if everyone acts appropriately then everyone's fine but if a, a few people act inappropriately then they're going to advantage themselves compared to the other people well i think there was a lot of i mean certainly for those of us who were involved in the a levels last year we had a lot of telephone calls from people saying the school down the road had gamed it and that's why they all got A's and we all got so certainly that that was there was sort of rumors swirling I think that there were some issues but I do think you have to be slightly careful because unless you've got the evidence base you could get into real trouble with the exam board uh, which could then lead if you're a teacher to um, possibly kind of competence questions about competence or even bad faith and therefore the engagement of TRA and the teacher standards so just putting my little regulatory hat on there for two minutes Alex um, I mentioned anyone oh, on the panel aware of any... no uh, Kareem sorry no no I was just going to say that Alex mentioned the difference between um... Alex I, I don't know what I mentioned yet because Kareem hasn't told me <laughs> I'm going to try for the third time. Alex <laughs> mentioned the uh, the difference between state schools and private schools. I think I think there's a real risk, isn't there, that with private schools there's going to be serious grade inflation. I mean, it's um, there are different pressures. There are just different well, pressures. I mean, some people would say that there's serious grade inflation anyway because of the significantly larger number of students who are given additional time in independent sector. There's a lot of um, gaming. The system would be the wrong word but I would say parents are fully aware and schools are fully aware of ways to ensure that reasonable adjustments are made um, as optimally as possible. Shall I put it like that? So, um, which is a whole issue. Um, but on the other hand, if you then get investigated by the exam board and all everybody's grades go down, that's terrible reputationally for you as an independent school. So, you know, I would say behave. Um, in line with the ethics and morals of your of your professional body. Um, is anyone on the panel aware of any maladministration bias complaints to the exam boards last year, which were upheld, i.e. which resulted in a change of grade? Well, I know at least one of those that was. Does anybody else know any? Alex, I know you did a few. Um, no, I haven't heard um, from, from them, so. I assume not. They haven't come back to me. So, but that might mean that they succeeded and, and didn't need any more help. So, hard to say. Yeah. Well, I certainly know a couple that I gave some sort of very preliminary advice on, where the parents sort of phoned me a couple of months later and said we succeeded. Where there had been, in fact, in both cases, it was where there'd been a diagnosis of a disability, kind of halfway through a year. And then reasonable adjustments hadn't been put in place. And I think there was an agreement at some stage of the appeal process that there needed to be a remark in those situations. Um, so the answer to that is yes, some, but not very many. Um, and then somebody's also asked about what role is there for competence standards? Well, there has to be, everything has to be assessed against competence standards. So if you're using competence standards, then that's a defense to any claim for, you know, we're upholding academic standards. What we're really looking about here is about the processes by which you go about assessing people, making sure that those processes are fair and adjustments have been made. And then everybody's on a level playing field, aren't they? And that's where things possibly over the past year might have gone slightly skew if because there hasn't been that level playing field because everyone isn't in the classroom, everybody doesn't have equal access to um, 
relevant support and expertise. But teachers sh still should be assessing. It's just checking to make sure that the process leading up to the assessment has accurately taken everybody into account, which sometimes can mean levelling up, you know, as Baroness Hale said in the case about 15 years ago. You know, it's about creating a level playing field, which sometimes means bringing some people up. Um, I think we've answered all the substantive questions. Um, I wanted to thank all my panellists um, for giving what I thought were excellent and really interesting talks. If anybody has any questions for us afterwards, you've got our details. This will be available on our YouTube channel, something which excites all of us with its kind of two views. <laughs> we're not quite going viral yet but who knows um and uh, obviously we're all here to answer any and all of your questions at any time thank you all very much for listening and um hope to speak or see you in person maybe even very soon thank you